Gandhi is completely out of touch with history. Here is Sumer in Mesopotamia. This is the famous ziggurat of Ur, uh, which is known as Ur of the Chaldees in, uh, in, in the Bible. Uh, and, and this uh, structure has been renovated many times, including most recently by Saddam Hussein. But this structure is about 4,100 years old. Uh, in other words, it's not the oldest thing in Sumer. Eridu and, and, and um, other, other Sumerian cities, Uruk, Lagash, are, are a bit older than that. Uh, it has a background, which archaeologists have traced. But this big structure, about, uh, just over 4,000 4, or so years old. You can see that it's a mud brick structure. It's very, uh, very nicely done. They have beautiful tile floors, very extensive brickwork. Obviously, this was an evolved civilization at that, at that point. Um, and interestingly, uh, Sumer has a myth of the flood. Uh, in fact, it's a fundamental myth to understanding ancient Sumer. Uh, it's in an epic called the Epic of Gilgamesh, the tablets of which have survived. Uh, and it's interesting when you look at the Ice Age, what happened in the, in the Arabian Gulf, or sorry, the Persian Gulf. Um, <laughs> which is that uh, that's how it looks today, but, but during the Ice Age there was a gigantic river system ran through the Persian Gulf, the combined streams of the Tigris and the Euphrates, and it was a, a green and pleasant valley, very suddenly flooded sometime after about 12,000 years ago. So the Epic of Gilgamesh tells the story uh, of effectively um, the Sumerian uh, Noah, who would not be still, is warned by a god of the coming cataclysm and advised to put men and women and, and all the seeds that will be necessary to grow plants in the future into an ark and the species of different animals. It's the progenitor of the Noah story in the Bible, right, uh, called Oannes, uh, who interestingly wears a fish on his head. Uh, these figures are found all over uh, Babylonian and, and, and Sumerian iconography. The fish-garbed figure, uh, Oannes, um, it was said to be a civilizer who emerged from the waters of the flood after the flood and taught mankind all the skills necessary to restart civilization. Not to start it for the first time, but to start it again. Uh, and he is um, depicted as a creature. It's part fish, part man, but I think the symbolism is, is very clear. He was able to survive the flood. If we go to magnificent uh, Egypt and... Um, the amazing uh, pyramids of, of, of so there's you know magnificent uh, Giza plateau, and there's the temple of Horus in Edfu. Many, which is a, a much later temple, many uh, Egyptologists will tell you that there is no Atlantis story in Egypt. There is no flood story in Egypt. They, 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 they repeat this like a mantra, um, and and they use it in part to discredit Plato because Plato said he got the story of Atlantis from his ancestor Solon, who in turn got it from the, Greek, from the Egyptians. Uh, and and they, the archaeologists say, but how can that be when there is no Egyptian flood story? But that's absolute balderdash, because there is a huge Egyptian flood story, and it's written in plain view on the walls of this temple. Uh, these are, they're called the Edfu building texts, and the, the background of the Edfu building texts is really interesting because they tell us that there was an ancient, ancient document, a document that was so old that it was falling apart, a document that was said uh, to have come down from the time of the gods. But, uh, in order to preserve it, in Ptolemaic times, they constructed this temple and they carved the texts into its walls. They're called the Edfu building texts, and they tell uh, of the homeland of the primeval ones on an island which was destroyed in a great flood and there were survivors and some of them came to Egypt and they established religion in Egypt and they established the sites where all future temples and pyramids would be built. So what these texts are telling us is not only that there was a flood, not only that Egypt was founded by flood survivors, but also every temple and pyramid that you see, even though it may date from a later period, has been placed on a site that belongs to a much earlier time and that was selected in a much in a much earlier time. So there's Plato and this resonant phrase that the, 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 the destruction of Atlantis in a single terrible day and night, uh, and that the destruction was so severe that mankind had to begin again like children uh, with no memory of what went before. 
And Plato tells us that he got that information from Solon. Solon dates from 600 BC, and Solon got it from the priests of Sais in the Delta in Egypt. So that means that uh, when they told him, when those priests told Solon that the flood happened, that destroyed Atlantis happened 9,000 years before that time, they're telling us it happened in 9,600 BC. That's 11,600 years ago. And as it happens, again, Plato has been accused of all sorts of things, but it's really weird because it, 9,600 BC is actually an incredibly important date. Uh, it is a date that marks exactly uh, what is called the end of the Younger Dryas, 11,600 years ago, 9,600 BC. So I spoke of the Ice Age and how it reached the last glacial maximum 21,300 years ago. Following that, there was a substantial uh, warming uh, 16,000, 15,000, 14,000 years ago. The Earth was warming up. It seemed to be coming out of the Ice Age. Uh, sea levels were, were rising, and uh, the, the, the whole planet was becoming a more, more comfortable place to be. And then suddenly, 12,890 years ago, and we can be very precise because of the Greenland ice cores, 12,890 years ago, give or take five years, a dramatic instantaneous deep freeze set in, and the world plunged back into extreme ice age conditions. And uh, there was a, a radical re-glaciation. Uh, and that was the beginning of the Younger Dryas, a very mysterious period. It's called the Younger Dryas because Dryas is a particular kind of flower species that s survives or doesn't survive in certain, certain climates. And uh, it lasted from 12,980 years ago until 11,600 years ago. Uh, and then the Earth started to warm up again. Uh, and and uh, everything that we know about the story of human civilization, it's really interesting, it all unfolds in that period, after the end of the Younger Dryas, after 11,600 years ago. And for me, the Younger Dryas is like a huge punctuation mark, uh, which caused radical changes on the Earth, and that we have to consider the possibility of what happened before the Younger Dryas. But the Younger Dryas may have been the event that made us a species with amnesia. Uh, and wiped out our memory of our past. Now, of course, the Atlantic is very much in the Atlantic Ocean, and that's uh, Athanasius's, uh, Athanasius Kircher's map of Atlantis. Um, in those days, uh, south was put on the upper part of the map, uh, but you know, we would like to turn this map around to see it in the way we normally do with Spain and North Africa uh, here, and the Americas here, and there's Atlantis in the middle. It focuses on the Atlantic, but actually this is a global story. Um, I would like to uh, consider that story and elements of that story in India, where we are right now. Uh, and where, up here in this area, existed the Indus Valley civilization, a civilization that, that coexisted with Egypt and Sumer, and was of at least equal scale, and was a very advanced civilization. Um, and this place is one of the ports of that civilization. It's called Lopal, and it's not beautiful to look upon, but this is what remains of a huge dock that was built at Lopal. This was a seafaring civilization more than 5,000 years ago. And uh, here is Mohenjo-daro, now in, in modern Pakistan, a very difficult place to get to. Santa and I had to have a, a, an armed escort to get to Mohenjo-daro. And uh, this is the great bath of Mahindradara. And here you can see the bitumen between the bricks where they waterproofed it. It was, uh, it was a very advanced construction. It's not very pleasing on the eye. It looks like a kind of modern housing estate. It's acres and acres and acres of brick. Um, but it is a very sophisticated civilization with flushing toilets, with drains. They really knew how to, how to live. They were, uh, they were every bit as advanced as the as the Egyptians or the uh, Sumerians. Uh, and uh, another site, uh, other Indus Valley sites, Dolabira is in India itself, and Harappa is in uh, northern in, in Pakistan along the, along the Indus Valley. So here we have this, this civilization that was flourishing uh, 5,000 years ago in India uh, and was uh, extremely extensive 
that traded with Sumer. We know that the, the ships went back and forth between the Indus Valley civilization and Sumer, uh, and that had a script. And uh, here are some of the so-called Indus Valley seals, which were used, to, they were stamped into clay uh, to reflect ownership. Um, and uh, one thing right off that has to be considered is that the Indus, the, the Indus Valley script may be totally a commercial language. It may be simply about um, uh, labeling commercial goods. Uh, it's, never been, it's never been deciphered. But what's interesting on some of these seals is that we see figures in known yogic positions. This position is not such a difficult one to do with the feet turned forwards under the body. But this position, where, as you can see, the, the guy's heels are actually forward and the toes are back underneath his buttocks. Now, just imagine doing that. You know, that is a really difficult yogic position. It's called uh, and, uh, and, and And you really have to have worked at yoga for a long time to get into that position. Well, what this is telling us is that 5,000 years ago in the Indus Valley civilization, yoga was already incredibly ancient. It was already a fully evolved system, which with its most advanced postures already worked out. Um, and, and we may only guess how much older than 5,000 years ago it was. Obviously, you don't create something like yoga overnight. Uh, it's something that takes a long time to develop. And here we see it flourishing in, the, in, full, in full form uh, in the Indus Valley civilization. And there are, here are examples of the Indus Valley uh, script, which remains undeciphered until this day. And there's a kind of craziness in scholarship, uh, which is related to race, in my, in my view, to racism and uh, to colonialism. Uh, the view has. The, most of us have heard of what is called the Aryan invasion of India, okay? And what the Aryan invasion of India actually is is a fantasy of the colonial era. There never was an Aryan invasion of India. It never, ever happened. But it suited the colonial mindset to imagine that this amazing culture of India had been brought to India by people from Europe. <laughs> so that's why the Aryan invasion theory was uh, invented. And uh, what scholarship in the last 30 years or so, and particularly in the last couple of decades, has shown is that it's complete nonsense. Uh, and that Indian civilization and Indian culture was, was sui generis in this continent. That's where it emerged. It was not brought in by blonde-haired, blue-eyed Aryans who Hitler so loved. It was a creation of the Indian subcontinent. Um, and that then raises questions over the most ancient texts of India, which are the Vedic texts, which are the origin of the Hindu religion, uh, which are supposed to have been the work of these Aryan invaders, that they brought the Vedas in with them to India. But now that we know that there were no Aryan invaders, we have to consider the origin of the Vedas. And we have to consider also the date that's put on the Vedas, because the Aryan invasion is supposed to have happened in 1500 BC. Well, nothing much was happening in India in 1500 BC, but 5,000 years ago, 3,000 BC, we had this gigantic civilization that we call the Indus Valley civilization. And more and more scholars are coming to realize that the Vedas really belong to the Indus Valley civilization, and that they were the uh, scriptures of that, of that civilization. So they're not from 1500 BC, they're from 3,000 BC or earlier. Uh, and uh, they were probably, for a very long period, entirely oral texts. In fact, it's been observed, observed in the 19th and early 20th century scholars going around talking to uh, Vedic uh, experts in different parts of India, would find they were able to recite identical texts from memory without any failure whatsoever, from, in, from the deep south of India to the far north. Um, and probably what happened in 1500 BC was that was the first time these texts were written down. Uh, previously, they had been they had been oral texts. Uh, so we have to consider the mysterious information that is conveyed in the Vedas now, which can no longer be dismissed as simple uh, myth or imagining. The, the, the constant references to oceanic travel uh, in the Vedas, not the work of nomadic people, but the work of seafarers. Uh, detailed knowledge of the sea and descriptions of the ice caps in the Himalayas melting and of huge floods pouring down over the land. Uh, it may be that the Vedas were already 
fantastically old, 5,000 years ago. They may go back uh, far, far earlier than that. They may go back right into the last ice age. And of course, we have the Indian flood myth, which is the story of Manu, um, who is rescued from the flood by the fish avatar of the god Vishnu. Uh, and Manu and the seven rishis, the seven sages, uh, are take, take a huge boat and sail across the waters of the flood, and they are, they are rescued by Vishnu in his avatar as a fish. And uh, they eventually land in the Himalayas, and they re-promulgate civilization from that, from that area. We have to consider what is going on in this, in this story. Are we dealing with the survivors of the lost civilization uh, who settled in the Himalayas and who uh, re-promulgated civilization from there? And perhaps another thing I would ask you to consider is our society is very much focused on technology and on material things. And our scholars tend to look for material explanations for the evolution of civilization. But maybe an earlier civilization was quite different. Maybe it was focused on spiritual values. Maybe it believed in disconnecting from material things. Maybe precisely those, those yogic uh, ideals, the, the ideals of the sadhus of India, were, were central to the civilization that we're, that we're looking at. Now, India during the Ice Age, very much more extensive than, uh, than, it is, than it is today. And the first place I started looking was up here in Gujarat, where Santa and I first went in 1992, to the city of Gwaka in Gujarat, because there is a specific local flood myth in Dwarka. Um, and that flood myth concerns the god Krishna. And it concerns the beginning of what we call the Kali Yuga, which is the, the age of strife and darkness that we still live in today. That, that Kali Yuga was brought on by a, by a flood, and actually if you work with the Indian texts, the, the, you can date that to around 3100 BC, which is, very, which, which is very close to the date of the beginning of the Mayan calendar, by the way. Um, there is Dwarka today, and there is the, the story of Krishna. It was the city of Krishna. It was a wonderful city, but eventually the flood came and destroyed it. And it so happens, this is where we started our diving in India, is that underwater, uh, off Dwarka, are extensive submerged ruins. In other words, the flood myth turns out to be true. And there is no way to date those ruins. There is no, no dateable artifact that has ever been found. There are large stone ruins at the bottom of the sea, off Dwarka in uh, Gujarat. And the whole, it's a sacred city, rather like Varanasi and uh, many rituals there are performed in, in connection with this lost city of Dwarka. Then, if we come in a little further down from Gujarat, the Gulf of Cambay, uh, there was this extraordinary finding in the early 2000s of uh, huge cities at the bottom of the Gulf of Cambay, 40 meters underwater. Uh, they'd been submerged for more than 12,000 years. And they were found with side-scan sonar, uh, it's, it's impossible to imagine that, this is a, a, that these are natural features. Uh, up to today, they have never been dived on. No submarine has ever been sent down. Uh, and the initial dredging work produced, up many, produced many man made artifacts uh, from those two cities which lie on either side of ancient river courses. But then all the work was stopped. And since about 2002, it's never continued. And I honestly can't tell you why. If we go to South India, we find a huge flood myth of a lost land called Kumari Kanda. And the, we are told that it was a highly civilized place and that it was destroyed by the gods in a single terrible day and a night. Guess when? 11,600 years ago. Exactly the same date that is given by Plato for the destruction of Atlantis. And interestingly, if we use the latest science to look at sea levels at that time, we find that southern India was vastly extended into the Indian Ocean, uh, that the Maldives Islands were much larger than they are today. And we do still find pyramids on the Maldives. They're quite small. That's an aerial shot of the little, one of the little pyramids on the Maldives. And that's a pyramid. You can see the wall of the pyramid there uh, in the Maldives itself. Uh, and um, uh, in um, Kanyakumari, at the very southern tip of India, uh, this, uh, this myth is, is preserved and, and elaborated to this day. So there's a huge memory 
of lost lands to the south of India. Uh, and here we find, as it was during the Ice Age, Sri Lanka was joined to South India. This is the feature called Rama's Bridge between Ramaswaran and, and uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, and you can still see uh, huge stone structures in the water there. Uh, and we have dived at Kumbhar and at Mahabalapur. And in both places, uh, we have found uh, major underwater structures. We've dived with Indian archaeologists at these sites, and, and nobody is disputing that these structures are man-made, and that they've been underwater for 12,000 plus years. Um, but again, for reasons that mystify me, this is Mahabalapur, where I did my first ever swimming lessons when I was about five years old. And I lived in South India. It was quite quite strange to end up going back to Mahabalipur as an adult and, uh, and scuba, scuba diving there. Went there with the scientific. Uh, these are the temple, the rock hewn temples of Mahabalipur on the shore. Uh, these are the fishermen who told us about the underwater city, and we made a big expedition there with the scientific exploration society from uh, London. And lo and behold, exactly as the fishermen had told us. Uh, there are indeed uh, cities underwater off the coast of Mahabalapuram. And they go for five kilometers out from shore. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't like conspiracy theories, but it really felt like a conspiracy because after we dived that site, all work was stopped and nobody was allowed to go back and dive it anymore. And the, the story was literally brushed under the sea until the Boxing Day tsunami, which exposed the ruins in the bay in front of the public room. And nobody could deny anymore that there were ruins there. And now a little bit of archaeology is going on at the site, but it's going on at, uh, in what's called the intertidal zone, at a depth down to just about five meters. They're not going out into the deep water. It's like a deliberate refusal to, uh, to consider the implications of this site. I'm putting my diary knife in the gap between blocks there. There are very extensive walls and there clearly was a, a city there, which is now which is now submerged. And at Tiruvannamalai, inland from there, is this amazing red hill called Arunachala, uh, with a huge temple complex at the base, and a myth there of how in the time of flood, this is where the sages, this is where the rishis go to preserve the knowledge of the of the Vedas, uh, that it's a place of refuge uh, from, from, from the flood. And uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous place to explore, Tiruvannamalai, and a wonderful, wonderful climb up the mountain. And it's full of sages and, and, and rishis and holy men to this day. In fact, there's one that guy up there who's had his arm above his head for the last, I don't know, 30 years. I don't know how they do that. But uh, he does. Let's jump east from India, there's submerged India. And let's go off and have a look at uh, Indonesia. There are the Indonesian islands today, the Malaysian Peninsula. But this was the huge landmass that was above water uh, during the Ice Age, uh, truly a continent sized landmass. And uh, this is a curiosity. This is, uh, you would think really that this was in Mexico by the look of it. It looks like a Mexican step pyramid. Um, it looks pretty much like uh, Chichen Itza, actually. but it's not. It's a it's a temple in Indonesia, in Central Java, and and uh, it's called Suku. Uh, how do archaeologists explain this? They say it's just a coincidence that <laughs> these things look similar to one another. Um, I think it, I think that we may be looking at a remote common source which has passed down influence in both places, and that that influence continues to flower and to express itself. Um, but what I really want to dwell on a bit tonight is uh, the site of Gunung Pada near Bandung in uh, West Java, which uh, is one of the very exciting new archaeological discoveries. And I was privileged, Santa and I went with our friend Robert Schock and his wife Katie. We went there in December uh, at the invitation of Danny Hillman uh, Natwajija, who is the chief geologist working on the site of Gunung Padang. Um, and uh, we, we went to Gunung Padang because something extraordinary has been discovered there. Uh, 
uh, and I was really pleased that Schock was able to come along and bring his geological perspective to bear on the, on the site. Um, because it's not archaeologists who are doing this work, it's geologists. Danny Hillman is the senior geologist at Indonesia's Geotechnology Center. He got his, PH, uh, his, his PhD at um, Cork Cornell. And uh, he is, uh, he's a remarkable man. And, and he's, when he started to say that it looks like Gunung Padang ranges between 9,000 and 20,000 years old, not just 2,500 years old, he stirred up a huge shitstorm of <laughs> archaeological fury. Um, and, uh, but he stuck to his guns and he's doing really good science on that site, some of which I'll show you. Uh, this, is, this is the overall setting of Gurung Padang, um, and that's the pyramid-shaped hill uh, on which the, the, the structures stand. And uh, it's about 100 meters high, that pyramid. It's an entirely artificial man-made pyramid. There's uh, Shock and myself, and that's Danny Hillman, on our way up uh, to the top of Gurung Padang. And uh, when you get up there, uh, well, Danny unfurls his uh, scanning results, which are very, very, very extensive. Uh, and and um, he starts making the point that this stuff is what archaeologists have been dating. This is the surface layer, the top, very top terraces at the top of the pyramid of Gunung Pada, uh, which are made out of a material called columnar basalt. Uh, that's a form of basalt that forms naturally into, into hexagonal blocks. Um, and uh, but it also makes a very useful building material. And there's this very extensive site on the top of what was thought to be a natural hill, uh, and, and it's that extensive site uh, that has been dated, really on no good evidence, just a tiny bit of carbon dating to 2,500 years old. For a long time, that's been the mainstream view, that this site is about 2,500 years old. Did the first extensive survey on the site. And uh, they point out that all the archaeology that has tied that site to 2,500 years ago is just based on a skim of this surface layer. And what they're really interested in is the deep layers of this 100 meter high pyramid, turns out to be entirely man made, which stands at Gunung Pada. Um, so there is the archaeological trenching, that's as far down as it went. That was all the information we had until Danny got to work. Uh, even the naked eye will tell you that there's much more. As you go down the sides of that pyramid, you can see that there are stones sticking out of the sides of the hill. And uh, it turns out that, as I say, that the whole upper layers of this are, are man-made. And Danny and his team used a whole range of remote sensing Equipment. They, they used surface geology, they used archaeology, they used geomagnetic survey, ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity, seismic tomography, drill core sampling, they did lab work, petrology, carbon dating, and so on, and uh, also architectural analysis. And here's an example, here's illustrations of Danny and his team at work. Uh, because about eight months ago, their work was stopped. They were, they were not allowed to continue to do any more work. And the reason they weren't allowed to continue any, doing any more work was because a cabal of archaeologists in Indonesia said, we know this site is just 2,500 years old, and there's no need for any further work. It's a sacred site. Don't interfere with it. Leave it alone. All the work has been done. But all the work hasn't been done. And the extensive survey that Danny and his team conducted before they were stopped uh, came up with some really intriguing results. I just want to show you some of the, the methods of, of surveying that they, that they used here. And, and hopefully you will understand that this was very thorough work that these people did. Very extensive work uh, on, on the... And uh, included in that work was carbon dating, which they did with drill cores. Those drill cores brought up man-made objects, cut stone, and they brought up organic material from the same layers that that cut stone was found in. And drill core one started to find material going back 7,000 years or so. The deeper you get, the more ancient it gets. And then 
16,000 years. And then when we get to drill core two, again, that top layer at 2,500 years, then 9,000, 7,880 calibrated years before Christ, 28,310 years old, 21,000 years old. And a nice series of dates from exactly 11,600 years ago, at the time of the end of the Younger Dryas, as we go through the various layers of this, uh, of, of this pyramid. So what Danny and his team are feeling is that we're looking at a monument that has been a monument since the last glacial maxima, and that has been continuously evolved and built up uh, over that, that whole period. And what a lot of their surveys unite on is that there's a chamber in that monument very high resistivity on the remote uh, scans. A large, regular chamber in the heart of the monument. <clears throat> and they're suggesting that it is a artificially altered uh, lava tube. Uh, oddly enough, under the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan, you have the same thing. You have a, a, a tunnel, which is a lava tunnel, which has been altered by mankind into a regular shape, and you have a chamber. That chamber is the raison d'etre for the construction of the Pyramid of the Sun. It looks like exactly the same thing. The, the, the thing is much too regular, according to the remote sensing, to be, uh, to be analyzed as a purely natural feature. It's definitely been altered by human beings. Uh, I'll just show a few more slides, all of which concur. Uh, there's the suggested entrance to the feature, all of which concur on the existence of a large chamber, an extremely high resistivity zone in the heart of Gulen Hall. And naturally, this is the chamber that they want to excavate. They would like to know what is inside that chamber down to the depths. And it's not the only one. Uh, there are two other chambers that have also been, that have also been found. And uh, the place is crying out for excavation, particularly when we consider the context. There is Indonesia today. And there's how it looked at the last glacial maximum. This was a huge continent. And that Gunung Padang site was built on the very high land at the southern edge of that continent. And that's why it's not underwater while the rest of the continent is underwater. They were, it was incredibly well watered with huge river systems, all of which were swept away by the floods at the end of the Ice Age, uh, until we end up today with the Indonesian islands as we know them. And all around Gurung Padang are a series of other unexcavated megalithic sites. So the whole area is looking incredibly promising from the point of view of investigating ancient history. Now, as I mentioned, Danny's work was stopped. The archaeologists intervened and prevented it, but Danny found a typically Indonesian way to get around that problem. Um, he doesn't give up. And he took it to the highest level. He took it to the president of Indonesia. And he persuaded the president of Indonesia that this work at Gunung Padang must continue and that it cannot be allowed to be stopped on the basis of archaeological prejudice. And just uh, two, three weeks ago, uh, the president visited Gunung Padang and he saw all of Danny's research and he's agreed that the research will resume and it's going to resume immediately. Uh, so within a year from now, we should have a much clearer picture of what is going on at, uh, at Gunung Padang. And I think it's one of the most exciting archaeological sites uh, in the world. 